Lokaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namaham Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shremati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschachyate Shatarine Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we welcome everyone to our uh, study of the Srimad Bhagavatam at the level of Bhakti by Bhav and we're on the fifth canto the section on Vedic cosmology. This evening we're going to go chapter 22 and maybe into chapter 23 also. Uh, It says that if we start s screen sharing, it will stop others' computer sound. Yeah. Sorry, Maris. Now we can, we can share, Maris. I removed it. You removed it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So... Let's see. Here's the PowerPoint. Okay, so. Very cosmology. So we were hearing about the, the movements of the sun and we were, we were establishing the principle which is uh, taught here in Srimad Bhagavatam that the sun is not in the center of the, the sun is not central Although it's central and vertical in the universe, it's not that everything is rotating around the sun. Rather, the planets rotate around the earth rather than the sun. So it's geocentric rather than heliocentric, right? We want to establish that the sun is traveling, moving. It's not that everything is moving around the sun, but the sun is moving itself. The earth, however, doesn't move. The earth remains on Bhumandala. So we were hearing about the orbit of the sun, how it visited the uh, Pushkara Dweep, and in Push Pushkara Dweep, remember, on Bhumandala there are seven dweeps, 
in the very center there is Jum Jumbo Dweep and on the very outside is Pushkara Dweep, right? We have Jumbo Dweep and then next island is called Plaksha Dweep and then we have uh, after Plaksha Dweep then it's Kusha Dweep and then Kroncha Dweep Oh, oh, Salimant, Salimati Dweep is after Plush, Plaksha Dweep, then Salimata Dweep, and then Kusha Dweep, and then Kroncha Dweep, and then Sat, Sata Dweep, and then the final out one is Pushkara Dweep. And in the middle of Pushkara Dweep, running around the mid, the, right through the center of Pushkara Dweep, in a circle you have Manasatara mountain and the sun god rides his chariot round the Manasatara, Manasatara mountain and he visits the different demigods who have their homes in the north, south, east and west on Manasatara mountain. So the sun god moves around Manasatara mountain and it creates day and night in different places as he travels. So we have the orbit of the sun in that way, going around Manasatara mountain, and the sun god riding his one-wheel chariot, one wheel on the Manasatara mountain, and, and it's the other axle is fixed on at Meru, at the summit of Meru mountain. So from Meru mountain to the Manasatara mountain gives us some idea, very, it's thousands of yojanas, many, many yojanas. And the sun god is there riding his chariot around the Manasatara mountain, creating day and night as he goes around the Manasatara mountain. And we heard how he's worshipped, how there's so many different uh, demigods all helping him and assisting him, right? Here's our diagram, here's the cross-section of the Bu Mandala with Mirror Mountain in the center. And over here on this side we have the different islands and the four residences here on either side. Right? So you saw that before. Then we spoke about the Uttarayana and the Dakshinayana, the sun rising and the sun setting. The moon also moving. All the planets are moving. These are vertical motions. But they also have their horizontal motions. The earth, however, fixed, not moving. But the sun is moving, the moon is moving, Rahu is moving. So, Uttarayana, Dakshinayana, that creates the lengthening and shortening of the days. We know from Makar, Makar Sankranti, then the sun starts to travel north. The so it's Ut Uttarayana, Uttarayana, and with the sun travelling north, the day becomes longer and the night shorter. And when it's travelling south, going to the south, then the day becomes shorter and the nights become longer. So this is all explained from these diagrams. Yeah, here we have, over here, Druvaloka, and then Mount Meru, and there's the sun rising. So when the sun rises, it comes up, then the radius is not so big, so it doesn't have to go so fast, it can slow down. But when the sun goes down, when the sun goes down, then the radius increases, so it has to go a bigger circumference 
So the speed will also increase because it has to cover the same distance. So this is described the daily movements of the sun. Well, we mentioned that, right? The sun's path of Manasatara mountain, the speed of the sun, and how the sun god is worshipped, the different sages, the Vaikilyas, or the size of a thumb, but 60,000 in number, and all the different resident people from the higher planets, Gandharvas, Apsaras, Nagas, Yakshas, Rakshasas, demigods. They form groups and they each do different services, right? They all, they all have their different services described in Srimad Bhagavatam, which services they do. Somebody is decorating the chariot and somebody else is pulling the chariot and somebody else is doing the kirtan and somebody is dancing. Alright, then we went on to chapter 22 and chapter 22 began with a question from Maharaj Parikshit that he wanted to understand how there could be some contradiction because it was described that Mount Meru is on one side, is on the left, sometimes he's on the left and sometimes he's on the right. And so Maharaj Parikshit was puzzled at how could it be that sometimes he's on the left of the sun and sometimes he's on the right of the sun. So this was explained, right? Maharaj Parikshit's about clockwise and anti-clockwise movements. And Sukadeva Goswami gave the example about the potter's wheel and some insects on the potter's wheel. So as the potter's wheel is rotating, the insects are doing, having their own motions independently. So in this way, they appear to be moving differently. We'll just read some of the notes here. There is no contradiction since there are two separate movements, the movement of the time wheel and the individual movement of the planets. So the time wheel, the Kala Chakra, is like the potter's wheel. In the individual movements of the planets, they're like the insects on the potter's wheel. So separate movements, right? You have the Kala Chakra moving and you have the individual movements of the planets also. But the, the planets are also on the time wheel, but they have the, at the same time their own individual movements. So the time wheel is carrying everything. The sun moves from east to west in the sky from our point of view, but in relation to the zodiac and other stars, the sun appears to move from Aries to Taurus, and other signs in the opposite direction. Thus the sun, moon and other luminaries move in a clockwise direction on daily basis. But with respect to the time wheel, they move in a counterclockwise direction and seem to be entering different zodiac, zodiac signs at different times. Okay, so this has to be... This has to be understood how they move, they appear to be moving into different areas. So studying these different signs, the, the positions of the different zodiac will affect everything, the situations and the nature of the environment and the climate and everything is affected according to the positions of these different zodiacs and the nakshatras. They are, they're all very significant in what's going on in the world situation. When we have some famine or when we have some disasters, just like now we're in the middle of an ongoing pandemic for some years and I'm sure the astrologers can relate it all to the positions of the different planets and not only the planets but also the nakshatras and the signs of the zodiac. Right? So that's the point that the, these stars and nakshatra, the, these uh, planets and everything, they're there to actually 
arrange for the enjoyment and also the karma of the people. So here it mentions, the Lord, as the sun god, arranged the seasons. Lord Narayan, the original cause of the cosmic manifestation, responding to the prayers of the sages, divided himself into twelve parts and created six seasons with qualities like heat and cold for the enjoyment of the living entities according to their karma. So this is stated in Srimad Bhagavatam that the Lord divided himself into twelve parts. And we'll have a look at that, how the Kala Chakra has twelve spokes. And these twelve spokes or twelve parts of the wheel, they represent the twelve months of the year. And the six seasons, they're like the, uh, the six seasons in the, in the year, they're six... Uh, there are six rims on the wheel. The wheel is divided into sections, six sections, and six rims. So they're like six seasons. And that's why we have in, in the year, we have every two months a different season. Just now, it's still pretty much the heat of summer. But in a very short time, the rainy season is going to come. Maybe another week or more, the rainy season will begin. And with the rain, of course, then the, 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 everything will cool down quite a bit. And that will encourage the farmers also, they can do a lot more farming, plant more rice, and so on, like that. People are pretty busy just now, they're getting ready for the rainy season. People all want to get their land planted, take advantage of the rains. And after the rainy season is gone, which rains will be a couple of months, and then you have the autumn. And then there's a different season, then cools down a bit, but then heats up a bit more, you get a bit, a bit warmer than, the, than in the rainy season. The rainy season be so cloudy, sometimes you'll never see the sun for a few days. So it can become a bit cooler, but then the autumn comes and then the weather becomes a bit warmer. Not quite like the summer, but still a bit warmer. And then after autumn, then the winter, like that. So every two months the climate changes. So this is arranged for the enjoyment of the living entities according to their karma. So according to their karma, some people are enjoying and some are suffering. Just like some people enjoy the heat and some people enjoy the cold. People who come from a very cold climate, they find it unbearable to be in the heat. They cannot tolerate so much heat. It's very difficult for them. And people from, a, from the hot climate, they have a di difficulty with the cold. So people are all, everyone's suffering and, and enjoying according to their karma. The note says, the Lord, oh wait, did I share the screen? Your screen is shared. Oh good, oh good. You can see everything then. Okay, there's a note here. The Lord, famous as time, divided himself into twelve forms and six seasons for purifying the activities of the people. So different points to note here. The Lord, famous as time. So that Kala Chakra, that is actually Krishna himself. That is Krishna, manifestation of Krishna's potency, as Kala Chakra. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Time I am, destroyer of the world, and I come to claim all people. So this Kala Chakra, on which the, uh, the zodiac is rotating, and, and also the nakshatras, they're also moving with the Kala Chakra. And the planets are also, they're on the Kala Chakra, although they have their own independent motions. So the Lord, famous as time, divides himself into twelve forms, 
12 months of the year and six seasons for purifying the activities of the people. People often speak about purification, but they often do not understand that we have to, we have to change the activities. If we want to be purified, it depends on our activities. According to how we act, we can get purification. If we act in the wrong way, we're not going to get purified. So the activities are very important. So the different seasons, they help, to, they arrange for the different activities of the people. People are meant to recognize different seasons, different functions to be observed in different seasons. Just like we know, and, uh, there's, there's auspicious times for doing different things, be, be coming up to the harvest, the people will they'll make sure it's a good time for the, the proper time to plant the ground, the proper time to harvest. So everything's done in the proper time, regulation. That's, of course, taking advantage of scriptures, to be guided by scriptures. So that's purifying, purification by the activities. People, they, we want purification the easy way. They think, just touch me, just touch me, put your hand on my head, that will purify me. But what really purifies us is the activities, not just some sentiment that, you, or you touch the feet of the sadhu, or the sadhu puts his hand on your head, what is really purifying is when you change the activities and we act in such a manner to really purify ourselves. So this means by manifesting himself as the time wheel, the Kala Chakra Gata, the Lord regulates and purifies our activities. So certainly by the influence of time, our activities are regulated and hopefully they will also be purified. Number four, worshipping the Lord in Varnashram. By following Varnashram Dharma and worshipping the Lord as the Son with faith, by yoga and by regulated activities, people can easily attain the highest goal. So again, Varnashram Dharma, important, recognizing our duty. We have some work to do. Varnashram Dharma means working. It doesn't mean being idle, it means doing different, taking on different responsibilities. And worshipping the Lord also as the Son. There are many demigods, and the demigods are all ordinary living entities. But the Son is a very special demigod, because the Lord Himself comes as the Son. The Lord Himself comes as the Son, too, uh, because He's the King of all planets. So worshipping the Lord as the Son, with faith by yoga, and by yoga, that's, we heard about yoga is for health, regulating the breathing, and uh, different activities which are regulated activities, yam and niyam. So these are all for purification activities which purify us. Then the months according to the sun. The sun, the soul of all worlds, passes through the twelve signs of the zodiac and takes on twelve different names. One month is two fortnights by lunar calculation or the time for the sun to cover 2.25 constellations and a day and a night for the pitris. Two months constitute a season. So this 2.25 constellations, this comes about because you have, in the, in the signs of the zodiac, you have 12, right? The, the, the zodiac is made up of clusters of stars. And these different clusters of stars often resemble different creatures. Just like one of the signs of the zodiac is Leo. Le we often say Leo the lion, right? So it's in the form of a lion. 
So it's called Leo. And uh, there are other signs of the zodiac, similar signs of the zodiac, and they have, when they're seen in particular ways, and they're given these different kinds of names. So 12 different names, 12 different signs of the zodiac. And then the nakshatras, there are 27, some, but sometimes 28, because Abhijit, which is a very auspicious nakshatra, sometimes appears and sometimes not. So you have 27 nakshatras, so 12 into 27 goes 2.25. So that's where the 2.25 comes. You have the 12 signs of the zodiac divided in, in or you have the 27 nakshatras, constellations, divided into the 12 signs of the zodiac. So it comes to 2.25. So that's how they arrange it. Here you have the signs of the zodiac. Right? The time, the time to move over half the zodiac belt is called one ayana. One ayana. Ayana. So here's Makara or Capricorn as it's called. Down at the bottom here. Right? And you can see the different names. We have the Western name and the Eastern name. So Makara is Capricorn, Kumba is Aquarius, Mina is Pisces, Aries is Mesa, Taurus is Vrishabha, Gemini, Mituna, Cancer, Karka, Leo, Simha, Virgo, Kanya, Tula, is Libra and Vrishchika Scorpio. Ah, that's the other. Scorpio, it's like a scorpion. So it's called Vrishchika or Scorpio. And then Danu, Sagittarius. So these names are given to these different signs of the zodiac. You can see the 12 sections. And we have the constellations, which are 27 in number. So they're divided among them, the same way, they're also like that, on the wheel of time. So 2.25 in each division, each of these. Each one of these sections is, the one, one wheel is 360 degrees, so 12 into 360 is 30 degrees. So this is 30 degrees, right? This one, one period, one period of the... Um, one period of the uh, the uh, zodiac. Zodiac. Thank you, Prabhu. Well, yeah, one period of the zodiac, thirty degrees. Right. Okay. So as the wheel turns, then we go through these different signs. The wheel is turning constantly from the beginning of Brahma's day to the end of his day. Endlessly the wheel is turning. And the, the, the uh, zodiac signs and the constellation, they're also moving with that Kala Chakra. So it brings about different changes. So some more points are made. Five names of the year. The, the time taken by the sun to pass completely through the Antariksha, Antariksha means the cosmic space. It's the space between uh, when you're going up on the northern way up to the top of the universe, if you're going up from Bhumandala, it's the space which is there after Dhruvaloka going up to the higher planets. So this is called Antariksha. And then you have the earthly plane and the heavenly planes. And sometimes the sun moves slow, sometimes quick, and sometimes medium. So three speeds. And in different planes which it passes through. 
so it has these different names. Samvatsara, Parivatsara, Idavatsa, Anuvatsara, and Vatsara. Note, the twelve zodiac signs, such as Sima and Tula, get their names based on the form manifested by a group of stars representing that sign. For example, if a group of stars are arranged in the shape of a lion, then the sign is called Leo or Simha Rashi. Rashi, right? Rashi is the what we would say in India, in the in India culture, in Hindu culture, we'd say Rash, Rashi. In the West, they simply say signs of the zodiac, but they're called Rashi. So everyone has, huh? everyone has a particular Rashi influenced by a particular Rashi. Number eight, the moon's position and movement. The moon situated 0.1 million yojanas above the rays of the sunshine travels at a speed faster than that of the sun with relation to zodiac. It covers the sun's year in two fortnights, its month in two and a half days, and its fortnight in one day. So the moon travels fast, high speed. Then the waxing and the waning of the moon. The moon, the moon creates day for the demigods during its waxing period and creates day for the pitris during its waning period. So the demigods take it with they like the daytime for their activities. Then Pitris, the meaning the forefathers, they're, they prefer the dark time of the day. So the waxing period, the moon is waxing, getting bigger and bigger, growing and waning, it's getting weaker and weaker and weaker. So that's when time for the Pitris. So we can see the, the, the day is divided into two, that the bright side of the moon is for the demigods and the dark side of the moon is for the Petris. So the moon that supports the life of all beings passes through one constellation in 30 muhurtas, one day. The one constellation, 27 constellations, right? Number 10, glories of the moon. Because the moon is full of all potentialities, it represents the influence of the Supreme Lord. And we're given different names for the moon. Manumaya, the pre predominating deity of everyone's mind. The mind, when there's a full moon, you'll find people, some people, they go mad whenever there's a full moon. I remember uh, being in New York, we used to have a, we had a temp, we have a temple there in Brooklyn. So this was in, in the 1970s when I was there, but I remember in those times, whenever there'd be a full moon, people would come to the temple in the middle of the night and they'd be banging on the door and they'd just be crazy, just be mad people. Because it's New York, and New York is a crazy place, and there's a lot of mad people. And when there's a full moon, it just seems to go to people's minds, and they just go berserk. So, Manomaya, the deity of the mind, the presiding deity of everyone's mind. We have trouble with the mind. We have to take shelter, maybe worship the moon. <laughs> Uh, I think, is it Aniruddha is the deity of the mind? Is it Aniruddha or Prajumna? Do you remember? Who is the deity of the mind? Mention it. Aniruddha. Aniruddha. Aniruddha, is it? Okay, so you can, we can benefit the mind by worship of Aniruddha. Then Anamaya, Ana meaning grains, of course. But he said, who, the, it's a name for the moon, meaning who gives potency to all herbs and plants. So, 
herbs and plants. So, Anna, by the grace of the moon, then these things grow nicely. It's important. If there was no moon, there would be no taste in the vegetables, no juice, and these, things, these herbs and plants would not be able to grow properly. Then Amrita Maya. Amrita meaning nectar, but meaning also Amrita, not dying, meaning deathless. So the source of life for all living entities. And Sarva Maya, one who pleases, he pleases everyone, the nature of the moon. He pleases everyone, demigods, pitris, human beings, animals, birds, reptiles, trees, plants. Wow, so many, and all other living entities. So this is, you can see the, the glories of the moon. It's really very wonderful that everyone takes advantage of the moon and they enjoy the benefits of the moon planet. So we wonder, how could the sun be the king of all planets? It seems like the moon is greater than the sun here, reading about the qualifications of the moon. But the sun is considered the king of all planets because the moon is a jiva. One of his names also is jiva. But the sun, the sun god, this is the sun god and he's the expansion of the supreme personality of Godhead. So that's the difference. The, the sun is not an ordinary jiva like the moon. Number 11. The 28 constellations headed by Abhijit. Abhijit, right? When the auspicious planet Abhijit comes, that's a time, that was a time for, is it, was it Lord, Chait, Lord Chaitanya appeared at the time when the Abhijit star appeared? Remember Mother Sachi was pregnant and she'd been pregnant for a long time and it, it was something like 13 months before she delivered her child. And it was her father, Nilambar Chakravarti, he was a renowned astrologer and he understood that the child in her womb is waiting for an auspicious time before he takes his birth. And he was waiting for this appearance of this Abhijit star. This is the auspicious star. So the Abhijit star is not always there, sometimes it comes and when it comes then there are 28 constellations. When Abhijit is not there, as mostly, usually not so much there, only 27. So the 28 constellations or nakshatras, as they're often called, headed by Abhijit, lie 0.3 million yojanas above the moon. Inspired by the Lord, they move clockwise around Mount Sumeru on the time wheel. So, the, yeah, the, the, next, the constellations, they're moving on the time wheel, but they also have their individual motion. By the will of the Supreme Lord, they are fixed on the time wheel. They do not have a different motion and move clockwise along with the time wheel. But move, they do not have a different motion, but move clockwise along with the time wheel. Kala Yani. And then the last two points are discussion of two planets, Venus and Mercury. Some of the different qualities which are involved. Venus, Ushana or Sukra, lies 0.2 million yojanas above the constellation, above the constellations. It moves like the sun, sometimes behind and sometimes in front of the sun. It is considered favourable for all by causing rain and nullifies the influence of planets that are obstacles to rainfall. And then Mercury is also auspicious. Mercury or Buddha, the sun of the moon, lies 0.2 million yojanas above Venus and moves in a similar fashion. Generally, it is auspicious, but when it does not move along with the sun, it produces a fearful situation 
with drought, cyclones and continual clouds. So we can see the influence of the different planets described here. Venus is usually favourable and Mercury can be can be favourable but can also give trouble. A speck can bring natural disasters. And then there's a summary of the different planets. So you can see the positions of the different planets, how these planets are all on the same level here. We have the Sun first of all, and above the Sun is the Moon, and then the nakshatras, the constellation, and then Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, they're all on the same level, Saturn also, and then above that, the, the Sapta Rishis, the seven Rishis, and above that, Dhruvaloka. And then the height with respect to the Sun is shown here. Dhruvaloka so far above, the Moon just a little bit above the Sun, but on a different orbit. Okay. So, we have some presentation, I want to show you something. Uh, Are you able to see this? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So, the actual portrait drawn by Sri Thiruvenkara Ramanujiya, which is still preserved in Melkote and Sri Perambudur, is seen in this slide. This is the entire picture drawn by Sri Thiruvenkara Ramanujiya, which shows all the different varieties of the entire this structure of Bhumandala and the universe. This is the entire universe which is surrounded by seven layers and in this universe this is the surface of the Bhumandala wherein this is the section of Jambudipa which is divided into nine parts. This is the Mount Meru, this is Dhruva Loka and here is Earth globe with the Bharata Varsha or Bharata Kanda which is there and its image is drawn here. A great Dviramshe Pippala Tatra Dviramshe Shisho Mahan Sarvashari Samavta so it's like that. This is about this particular earth globe, how it looks like. And these are the remaining islands and the remaining oceans, etc. This is local local mountain, etc. And beneath this Bhumandala, there are seven lower planets, beneath the Master Dikajas, etc. etc. These are upper planet systems are shown here. And this is the chariot of the sun in which it travels with single wheel and driven by Aruna, etc. These are the heavenly planets talking about all the heavens ultimately leading to the Vaikuntha, the abode of the Lord Vishnu. 
and this is about the formation of the eclipse rahu ketu movement which caused the lunar and solar eclipses etc this is thus all the details are encapsulated in one drawing which helps us to understand what and how the universe is functioning the about the same thing let us see a small video probable desire for the diagram was not to go unfulfilled that elusive map was discovered by shri prabhupada's disciples at the holy village of melakote some 50 kilometers north of mysore karnataka in india this diagram accurately depicted the entire cosmology of shri mad bhagavatam in an ingenious yet simple rendering the person through whom it was revealed to the world was the 19th century scholar saint tiruvenkata ramanuja g r swami Born in Sri Purumbudur, Tamil Nadu, Tiru Venkata Swami went on to become an Acharya or spiritual leader in the preceptorial line known as the Sri Sampradaya. He spent several years of his life in Melakote, which 900 years earlier had been the residence place of Sri Pad Ramanuja Acharya. the most prominent acharya of the Sri Sampradaya. At Melakote in the thousand year old temple, Tiruvenkata Swami studied and taught the Vedas and also worshiped the deity of Tiruchiruva Narayan. Asia and Africa. 
while the people leaves corresponded with North America, South America, and Australia. These continents comprise our Earth, which the Mahabharat calls Bharatkunda. Vishnu Purana also describes the Earth as Bharatkunda and gives its diameter as 8,000 miles. The Earth is also referred to by the name Bharatkunda in the invocation Sankalpa Mantra, chanted by Brahmana priests since time immemorial up until the present day. Vedic cosmology gives descriptions of the entire cosmos, including its subtle features. Perception and access to these subtle features, however, requires karmic qualification. Consequently, much of the cosmos described earlier, as well as parts of the cosmography about to be described, are imperceptible and inaccessible to us earthly inhabitants. Did you get, were you able to take all that in, Ramakrishna Prabhu? Uh, yes, Prabhuji, yes, Maharaj. But I'm still not convinced completely on the concept that how on a plain surface there's one globe, only the earth is just sitting around and uh, none others. So that concept is not pretty clear and because uh, uh, we do not see any other similar kinds of the planets if we are talking of the Khanda, as part of the Khanda, because uh, it appears to me something missing there. Well, I think the problem, maybe a lot of it, is that, that we're basing too much on pratyaksha, that you want to experience it with your senses, you want to see it. You know, there's a lot of things which we're not going to be able to see. And the Acharyas, you know, they point this out because this is, of course, this has been the, the, big, the big question which they've had to deal with since, since the, the, in the course of the preaching. That people say, you can't see it, where is this? You know, we never see it. Even parts of Bharadvars we can't go to. We have, but we have to understand that Pratyaksha, just using our senses, is not the way. The process is Shabda, that we have to hear, and we have to hear from the Shastras. And if we hear from the Shastras, then we're getting reliable information. That's the absolute truth. So, of course, rather than just uh, our own uh, trying to understand everything with our limited mind and senses, we have to, we have to just like uh, like we saw that saint, the Ramanuja saint, you know, by prayer and meditation, and that he could realize the proper situation, how to understand. You know, he was pondering that verse from Mahabharata, he couldn't understand it, but then, you know, he thought about it deeply, and he prayed, and he chanted, and meditated, and then it was revealed. Everything then came clear to him. Just by turning the picture around, he could see. So it's, it's important, it's, a, it's certainly a, a big issue. We can't expect to see everything with our senses. We have to be willing to uh, hear and to accept the authorities, what they're saying. If it's actually there in the scriptures, that should be enough for us. Whatever the scriptures are saying, we have to accept that. We can't argue with the scriptures. Yes, Maharaj, completely agreed and uh, accepted on that part. Because either in the Bhagavatam or in uh, 
relative scriptures, we do not see a very clear description discussing about the Bharata Khanda in a globular form or a spherical form. So that was something which we, I wanted to just have an understanding about that. There is no such specific description which says... No, it's pointed Bharata out. The, he was pointing out it, when he spoke, he spoke about the, the, the fruit, right? There's another section, there's another recording, I'll try to find it to show you where the devotee speaks about it and it's stated there, you know, the earth, the, the, how it's globular, that it is globe, in a globe form, spherical form. But it's, it's certainly there in the scriptures. Yes, Maharaj, I understand. Maybe I do not have a complete understanding of it, so I need to explore that as well. Yeah. There's a lot of material on it, a lot of different devotees have spoken on it and lectured on it and made presentations on it. I'll sh I can share some of my links with you. If you like, you can go through them, if you have the time. <laughs> sure, it'll, be, it'll be really very interesting and also enlightening. There's a lot of material on the internet. I, I have shared my links which I got from the internet and you can, if you have the time, you can go through them. Actually, sure. we'll give that for all, all of the students, any of you who are interested. You also may like to see some of these different uh, lecture, recorded lectures and so on, which are all posted on the internet. We want to take advantage to hear from as many devotees as possible. And the more we hear, then the more this concept begins to make sense, it becomes clearer what's going on. And they have a lot of evidence to support it as well. You know, there's so much... I was telling the other day about Tosi Das, how he was describing Hanuman going to the sun, and the dist Hanuman thought the sun was some playful bright object he could play with. So he described the distance to the sun and the distance which Tosi Das gave is supported by modern scientific evidence. And there's a lot of different explanations. You know, modern science, they always have to adjust their thinking and their explanations. But the Vedic philosophy, it remains the same. It's unchangeable, it's absolute. Infallible, the truth is there. We don't change Krishna's message. Krishna spoke, it's all revealed. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the concept of Bharatkanda was definitely there. You were doubting that, but it's there. It's, it's, it's in Mahabharata, it's in the Vishnu Puranas, it's all there. And, and so there's so many things, you know, we may not know, but you know, we have to understand that uh, something must be, that, that, that there's some, tr it's all truth there. We just have to go deeper and uh, do a bit more research on it and it can all be revealed to us. I, some of the, some of the Sampradayas, we see the Goswamis don't seem to have written too much on this. The Goswamis, I told you like, Sanatana Goswami and Brihad Bhagavatamrita, he described about going to the upper planets, about going to Janaloka and Mahaloka and Tapaloka and Satyaloka and then going into the impersonal Brahma Jyoti and also going through Shiva Loka, uh, uh, Kailash and meeting Lord Shiva and then he went into Vaikuntha and he went to Mathura and Ayodhya and then he went to Goloka, so that's all there. But they didn't mention about Jambudweep. He didn't mention, the Goswamis don't seem to have written much about this, about Jambudweep and Bhumandala. But certainly it's very well established and very important information and it's recorded here. And, uh, the, the, the Sri Vaishnavas, they just got that, they were certainly, well, they all know about it. And the Madhvas, the Madhvas, also the, this uh, Madhva Acharya, there was one, uh, one of the successors in the line of Madhva, uh, Jai, Vairaja, huh? Jai Raja, 
Turther, Jai Raja Turther, he also wrote about it, he did some research on it and everything goes. Veera Raga Maharaj? Oh, Veera Raja, ah, yes, yes, that's right. Thank you, Prabhu. Veera Raja. I think, I, think, I think it was Vadi Raja. Anyway, one of the, something, one Tirtha, he was a Tirtha, you know. And he lived 120 years and he did some amazing things, you know. And so he wrote about it and, you know, his he has a, a book on it, he has it, it's called Book Go, Bu, uh, I, I can't remember what the name of but he's got a whole book, he wrote a whole book and he's describing all about Bhumandal and Jambu Dweep and everything. And the information is all just the same as we're presenting. So certainly the, the Sri Vaishnavas, the Madhvas, and I was saying Sringiri, they had the chariot, the Sun God's chariot there with the one wheel up there in Sringiri. So they're also aware of it. They also know about Bhumandala and the Sun God and everything. And Prabhupada, wait, the, there's a, I'll show you the film about where Prabhupada, uh, I have another little film here. I'll just try to find it. Thinking of time 
in millions of kalpas. A kalpa is about 4,320,000 years. Following the instructions of Srila Prabhupada, now the followers of Srila Prabhupada trying to develop the same temple of all the factors. All these things will be showcased in our uh, new uh, temple of Tivo uh, Vipina Maharaj. Yes, that's the plan. Yes, this is all. They're all. They've been working on it for many years, and some of the devotees have done. And they're, you know, it's just unfortunate this pandemic situation has come about certainly delayed the whole thing, otherwise it would have, it's all there, it's already, you're just waiting to be put together practically. It's all, all the research and everything and the models and everything all made. And when, we, when it opens then, you know, because we've been studying this, so when we come to Mayapur we will actually have a better understanding, we'll be able to grasp it much easier. Hopefully. <laughs> of course it it's a big job. There's a lot a lot to be understood. But it's a very, the very interesting, very important for us to be familiar with these things. And Prabhupada said it's powerful propaganda if we can explain all of these things to people. Of course, to ordinary materialistic people, it all just sounds, oh, you know, this is just some fairy tale. You've never seen these things, you know, you, you've never seen these demigods. You say demigods, you've never seen them. Just like people, atheists, atheists they say like that. You never see God, where is he? You know, you never see him. And they don't have the eyes to see. They don't have the abilities to see. They don't have qualification. They want to see. Prabhupada would often say, why you give so much importance to seeing? Why can't you hear? You have to hear, that's the important thing. Our eyes are very limited, very imperfect. What can we see with our, pu our puny little eyes? Many animals have more powerful eyes than us. Our vision is very limited, the powers of our senses, very imperfect, very restricted. But if we hear from the authorities, Sukadeva Goswami, Srila Vyasadeva, these personalities, they, they wrote these books for us to make us more aware of the rest of the creation, this cosmic manifestation. We have, we know nothing, we know very little about this world. And when we're presented with some new phenomena, new ideas, we wonder, how could it be? How is this possible? So it's very important for us to get the nice uh, grounding in this, from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Sukadeva Goswami is presenting, he said, he said himself, he said, I can't present everything, I, I can't tell you everything, because it, it, the creation is just so vast and so unlimited. But as much as I've heard, I can tell you. <laughs> so Krishna consciousness is really something very special, very unique. And as we go on more and more, there's so much more to be learned, so much more to be understood. There's no limit. We should never think, oh, now I know everything, now I've learned everything. There's always so much more. And so many things beyond the power of our mind and senses. 
So we have to hear. And we have to really pray. As, as, as they were saying, there, there's, a, there's a subtle creation. Beyond the gross manifestation, there's a subtle creation. And to enter into that subtle creation, you have to, we have to purify ourselves. Okay, so let's see where are we? Oh no. Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay. So chapter 22, the orbits of the planets. So Sukadeva Goswami has been describing this. He answered the question of Maharaj Pariksha. He satisfied him. Okay, text number four describes about the system of four varnas and four ashrams and worshipping the Lord, Narayan, who is situated as the sun god. Worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead according to ritualistic ceremonies handed down in the three Vedas, such as Agnihotri, higher and lower fruit of activities, mystic yoga. In this way one can very easily attain the ultimate goal of life. Very easily, right? <laughs> Is it easy? Not so easy. <laughs> Prabhupada said, chanting Hare Krishna. He said, I said, process is simple. I never said it would be easy. <laughs> simple process, very simple. I sa he said, I never said it would be easy. Here it said, they very easily attain. They very easily attain because they did all of these things. They followed all of these higher and lower fruit of activities. They did Agnihotri and they practiced the process of mystic yoga. So because they were doing that, so then the, the results come very easily. So if you follow the process, you get the result. As we were saying, the activities are very important. You want to get purified, we have to act in a manner to get purified. It's not just get some cheap blessings. Then text number five, the sun god, who is Narayan or Vishnu, the soul of all the worlds, is situated in outer space between the upper and lower portions of the universe. The sun god is in the middle of the universe on the vertical scale and Meru Mountains in the middle of the universe on the horizontal plane. So passing through 12 months on the wheel of time, the sun comes in touch with 12 different signs of the zodiac and assumes 12 different names according to these signs. So we saw the wheel with the 12 divisions. So the aggregate of these 12 months is called Samvatsara or an entire year. And according to lunar calculations, two fortnights, one of the waxing and the other of the waning, make one month. So that same period is one day and night for the planet Pitriloka. According to stellar calculations, a month equals two and one quarter constellations. So I, I, I explained that, 27 constellations into 12 signs of the zodiac, 12 signs of the zodiac, go into the 27 constellations and you get two and a quarter. So when the sun travels for two months, a season passes. 12 months, 6 seasons, so 2 months each season. Therefore, seasonal changes are considered parts of the body of the year. Thus, the time the sun takes to rotate 
through half of our outer space is called an ayana or its period of movement in the north or in the south. So Dakshayana, Uttarayana, Dakshayana, so Ayana. So it moves to the north for six months, moves to the south for six months. That's the, that's the period of movement. And that, because the sun is moving like that, so then, then we get longer days and shorter nights, and then longer nights and shorter days. And that's when we get winter and summer. And then sun god is three speeds, slow, fast, and moderate. The time he takes to travel entirely around the sphere of heaven, earth, and space at these three speeds is referred to by learned scholars by the five names, Samvatsara, Parivatsara, Itavatsara, Anuvatsara, and Vatsara. We're not given any details about these five names. I'm not familiar with the meaning of these words that I could tell you what they mean. Maybe, well, we've heard Samvatsara meant one year, right? What does Parivatsara mean? Parimu mean complete, is it? There must be some differences here between these five different names. I don't know exactly what the differences are. Anybody can help me? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. The three speeds which is referring here as slow, fast and moderate is uh, referring to the circle what the sun actually does oh, because of the pull of the wind from the Dhruva Loka, vertically there is a displacement when the longest of them is the earthly rotation and the intermediate rotation is for the Bhuvar Loka and the above is the Swarga Loka. So uh, during the Swarga Loka it's the fastest and uh, the slowest is on the earthly level. So that's how the three speeds are done. And according to that rotations, these five different names are given for the same period of year. For the same what? The same, for the period of year. For example, if it is rotating in the slowest speed around the earthly level, it's called as the Samvatsara. When it goes upper towards the Swarka Loka or the uh, intermediary Bhuvar Loka, it takes another name. So that circle, the rotation, is considered to be the year. So that's why we have different uh, period of time as what you see from that of the Bhu Loka, that of the Swarka Loka. But they're all called as var Vatsara or the Sambatsara. Okay, so that's interesting, very interesting. So the, could you explain that again about the five different level, about why there are five different names? Yeah, even though there are three different speeds that is mentioned, and they are given the five different names because there are also intermediary levels, so which is uh, covered. If you remember, you had shown us a slide in which you said that there are 180 circles yes. in, which the, in which the sun actually moves around. So these 180 circles are concentric and they are from the center of the circle, they are extending outward. That means if the sun focuses on the innermost, he would rotate at much, uh, what you call a slower pace as compared to what he would rotate when he is in the extremely of the, uh, on the peripheral circle. So the circle is referred to as Vatsara. So there is a time period difference or what we say from that of the inner circle to that of the outer circle. So each of them are categorized and that's how these 
names were given. They are generally categorized as to as five. So some words are referring to the uh, earthly, while words are referring to uh, set of circles a little above. And when you go further up and up, to what's the refers to that of the swarga. Oh, okay. Very interesting. Thank you very much for that. I, I should be corrected, Maharaj, if I have not understood correctly, please. Where did you take it from? Where did you get this from? information from? Also from, from the same Bhagavatam. I try to understand this and try to figure it out. Oh, I see. So what, is that, what does that 180 circles mean? And how does that actually configure? And as we see the vertical movement of the sun along with the rotational movement of the sun. Yes. So if you calculate it when it is rotated, vertically moving, so there is a displacement. So, according to the displacement, the periphery of the circle changes. And whereas the rotation keeps the same. So, as like how we would do any centrifugal movement, you take a piece of stone and tie it to a piece of thread, and on the one end you hold it and then try to rotate it. So, you will find that if the length of the rope is longer, you will find the rotational speed is increasing. And when it comes to innermost, it reduces. So the same concept is used here. Ah, okay. Yes, very nice. Certainly makes sense, everything you said. So it's also mentioned <laughs> that there's a sixth samvatsara, but because that samvatsara is extra, solar system is calculated according to the five names. Yeah. So when the Abhijit comes in, <laughs> this is because of the difference in motions between the uh, lunar and the solar. This, uh -huh. uh, the moon is on an upper circle, so his peripheral radius of rotation is smaller. Uh -huh. That means circumference what moon covers is smaller, as compared to that of the sun, since he is in the outer periphery. Yes. So. There is a difference. Moon rotates the circle faster. The same point, if you talk of the same point by which the sun rotates, uh -huh. moon is much faster. That's how we understood it even in the previous verses. Yes. So when, when we talk of a calendar of a, a lunar or a solar, there the to try to match the uh, the Vedic calendar with the Georgian calendar, this adjustment has been made. That's why you have one, like how we have a leap year or how we have the Adhikamas is exactly the same that is being referred to. Okay. Yeah, this Prabhupada mentioned that in the purport. Of course, he's mentioning how the sun is six, six days more and the moon is six days less. Because the moon is traveling so fast, so it will take less time. So the difference between the sun and the moon is 12 days. So 20 to 6 is 72. So divided by 2 will be about 36. That's how the two extra months that is being referred to. Uh -huh. Yeah, two extra months. But I was understanding it's only we only have like one extra month. It's like the Purushottam Mass, right? It's once every three years. Yes. So here we are talking of six years. Yeah? That's what he referred over here. Oh, Each year, of, over a period of five years, that's referred there. Yeah, he said five years. That's what puzzled me because it, uh, Purushottam so Mass. In is five years, in five years there are two months added. So in every fourth year, as what we see, one month is added. That's what it. Okay. Every fourth year, one month is added. The fourth year, we add one month. That's why we get the Adik months. But five years, two months. Yeah, it, it's a rough calculation. It's it's not precisely the uh, go by that particular figure. It, it's very, in fact, it's in decimals to say. Uh huh. Okay. Anyway, that's what they're talking about, though the Purushottam mass, right? Yes, yes. And in the Western calendar, they try to adjust it with the leap years. Yes. That once every four years you have a leap year. Yeah, the fourth 
year is the leap year. So three years passes, the fourth year is the leap year. Right, 28 days in ordinary years and 29 in the leap year. So yeah. just, they just had on one day in the Western calendar, one day in yeah. the four years. Okay, so interesting information here. Thank you, Prabhu. Very helpful for us. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, go going ahead, text number eight. Above the rays of the sunshine, by a distance of 100,000 yojanas, is the moon, which travels at a, feet, a speed faster than that of the sun. In two lunar fortnights, the moon travels through the equivalent of a sambatsara of the sun. In two and a quarter days, it passes through a month of the sun. And in one day, it passes through a fortnight of the sun. Prabhupada gets into discussing about the modern science, about their calculations. Modern scientific calculations are subject to one change after another, and therefore they are uncertain. We have to accept the calculations of the Vedic literature. These Vedic calculations are steady, astronomical calculations made long ago and recorded in the Vedic literature are correct even now. Whether the Vedic calculations or modern ones are better may remain a mystery for others. But as far as we are concerned, we accept the Vedic calculations to be correct. <laughs> so Prabhupada is very clear where he stands. They asked Prabhupada, is the earth flat, Prabhupada? Because they were having, you know, they were having difficulty also like that. Is the earth flat, Prabhupada? Prabhupada said, well, it's flat where I'm standing. <laughs> he said, where I'm standing is flat. He said, where I see everywhere it's flat. Prabhupada uh, certainly wanted to support the Vedic evidence. He wanted us to display everything, make everything visible, let, let everybody see how it's going on, how it's happening. Otherwise people just think it's all just fantasy. Okay, text number nine, when the moon is waxing, the illumination, the illuminating portion of it increases daily, thus creating day for the demigods and night for the pitas. When the moon is waning, however, it causes night for the demigods and day for the pitas. In this way, the moon passes through each constellation of stars in 30 mohurtas, an entire day. The moon is the source of nectarian coolness that influences the growth of food grains and therefore the moon god is considered the life of all living entities. He is consequently called Jiva, the chief living being within the universe. So as I said, he's called Jiva. He's not God, but he's called Jiva. But he's very, very powerful. To just imagine what, what kind of pious activities you have to perform to become the moon god, to take on this kind of responsibility. How many pious activities he must have performed? What was their karma in order to get that position? Just like, you know, somebody's a, you may get the, the position of being a, the, the CEO of some multinational corporation. So you have to have a pretty good karma to get in. So how much more the karma has to be to get into the position like this, to be the god of the moon, to affect the whole universe. But of course there's so many universes, and an unlimited number of universes. In every universe there's a moon, there's a sun. So there's a lot of jobs. <laughs> But why, do you, why would you want to get a job there? Better to get a job in Krishna's service and go back to Godhead. Because even the moon god, his job is going to run out, his contract's going to run out one day. 
is going to have to give up, have to retire, to step down. So Sukadeva Goswami goes on to explain more about the moon, describing the different names of the moon. Because the moon is full of all potentialities, it represents the influence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So the Lord's influence is there, controlling people's minds and providing grains and the source of life, very powerful. So the moon pleases everyone, again mentioning how he pleases everyone. And the moon is also all-pervading, the moonlight is all-pervading by his light. So in this way, Sukadeva Goswami has glorified the sun and now glorifying, we have the glorification of the moon. Now he moves on to speak about the other planets in the universe and the different stars. And there's so many stars, so many planets, there's many, there's, there's all different kinds of stars there. And who are these stars? It said some of them are people, and some of them are different uh, Kshatriyas who are killed in battle. They go to the heavenly planets and they're given a chariot and they can ride their chariots and they can go to different meetings with Indra, the king of the demigods. And sometimes you can see the stars moving very fast across the sky. There's sometimes these are actually people. All of these different things, the stars which we see in the sky, they're all different personalities and they each have their chariots and they're moving at different speeds. They're fixed to the wheel of time. They rotate with Mount Sumeru on their right their motion being different from that of the sun. Twenty-eight important stars headed by Abhijit. Usually twenty-seven, but twenty-eight with Abhijit. So this, these stars, these constellations or nakshatras. And then above this group of stars, the planet Venus. And Venus is good, Venus is auspicious, providing nice things. Venus moves behind the sun sometimes, in front of the sun, sometimes behind it, nullifies the influence of planets that are obstacles to rainfall. We need rain everywhere they need rain. And so Venus helps for the planets to get rain. It's considered very favourable for all beings. So Venus is a good, a good planet to have on your chart, right? Very favourable. Then Mercury similar to Venus. And we're told the, the height above the, above the earth, above the sun, the difference between Venus and Mercury. And we're told Mercury is always very auspicious for the inhabitants of the universe, but when it does not move along with the sun, we have to watch out, maybe a cyclone or some disaster coming. One of them is mentioned here, waterless clouds. You get clouds but no rain. This is a symptom of Kali Yuga again, inauspicious, right? You have clouds but no rain. So clouds mean no sunlight. You don't get the heat of the sun, you don't get the light of the sun. And you don't get rain either, you just get clouds. Not very good. Cloudy days. Reminds me of England when you speak about rain and clouds. <laughs> Prabhupada was on, on television in England and they asked him, what is it like in hell? 
Prabhupada said, this England, he said, this is hell. Never see the sun. Every day cloudy, rainy. All right, and then text 14 goes on to describe more. We're told about, about Mercury as the planet Mars. It, it almost always creates unfavorable conditions in respect to rainfall and other influences. Oh, here it's mentioned about Parivatsara, right? So it says, in text number 15, it mentions, situated miles above Mars, or 10,400,000 miles above Earth, is the planet Jupiter, which travels through one sign of the zodiac within the period of a Parivatsara. So how did you describe that period of a Parivatsara? This, because as you see here, vertically, uh, Mars is much, much above the Sun and the Moon and the Mercury. So when the Sun travels vertically towards the inner side of the circle, then the peripheral rotation will be decreased. Yes. So here, what we see is that, that's what is being referred over here. So Parivatsara is the inner side, is Parivatsara, it? Parivatsara is the peripheral distance, which is called, considered to be, like for example, in, on the earthly level, which we call it as Sambatsara, the periphery is much, much, much bigger. So as compared to the Mars, what we see over here, the Parivatsara, the peripheral circle is lesser. So you find the, the descriptions given, the, the period of the year is considered to be Parivatsara in the Mars and further down it is Sambatsara. Oh. Oh, so Parivatsara is for, for the higher planets. Yes. Similarly, the intermediate, in between, you have all these five different levels, five different names given for all the different levels. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. So, Parivatsara is a higher level, is it? Yes. The, it's at the top, is it? No, it's the level for the Mars. And above, for the Swarga, it's Vatsara. Oh. Swarga is above this. Uh -huh. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Swarga is below this, Mars is on the higher level, and above this will come the Saturn, the next one. So Swarga Loka is below, and the Mars and the Saturn is much higher. Oh. Okay. Uh, Maharaj, or else can we understand like this, uh, the time taken for the Sun to complete one rotation through the Earth, it is called as Samvatsara. Similarly, one, the time taken for the sun to rotate one circle of Jupiter is Parivatsara. Can we understand this way, Maharaj? Mars. Uh, no, Jupiter, Prabhu. If you read down. Yeah, this is uh, Jupiter. Jupiter it is. Yes, correct. You are right. So that's right, Prabhu, right? That's correct. Yes. So the, the earthly year refer, I mean the year referred for the Jupiter is Parivatsara and the year referred to the earth is Sambatsara. Oh, the year referred for the earth is Sambatsara and the year referred for Jupiter is this Parivatsara. Parivatsara. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, so it's good I'm learning. Thank you. Alright, and here, here we have Anuvatsara. This is for Saturn. Yes, Maharaj. So, time taken for the sun for one year is Anuvatsara. The entire zodiac circle, oh, it says in 30 Anuvatsaras. Okay, this, well, let's read the whole thing. Okay, it's, 
passes through one sign of the zodiac, Saturn passes through one sign of the zodiac in 30 months and covers the entire zodiac circle in 30 anuvatsaras. 30 months. Covers the entire zodiac circle. 12 zodiac circle, the 12 signs of the zodiac in 30 anuvatsaras. Oh, 30 anuvatsaras. So one anuvatsara means 30, one month, is it? One sign of the zodiac in 30 months. And covers the entire zodiac circle in 30 anuvatsaras. This planet is always, uh, yeah, we know that, right? So, is it the same principle? That one, one Anuvatsara represents the time taken for Saturn to go around the Sun? Not to go around the Sun, but Saturn is going, about, it's going around the, well, it's going around the, the pole star is going around the earth. It's talking about uh, going around the different zodiac constellations, Maharaj. Going around all the zodiac constellations. Yes. One sign of the zodiac, it says, passes through one sign of the zodiac constellations in 30 months and covers the entire zodiac circle in. 30 Anuvatsaras. Yes, so, Anuvatsaras refer to a different level of a circle, Maharaj, not specifically to the Saturn, but it is above. And so they are in, in this purport, the, I mean, in the translation, the reference is given from with respect to the Anuvatsara, not with respect to Parivatsara. Wow. Anyway, one sign in 30 months and 12, there's got the entire zodiac circle means 12 signs. So that's yes. 360 months. Yes. So 360 months is, well... So 360 months is considered to be as 30 Anuvatsaras. That's what it means. Okay. 30 Anuvatsaras. So, yes, and so that 30 Anuvatsaras, the, the, the reference of Saturn's circle is not Anuvatsara. It is somewhere much below, but then they are taking the reference of that Anuvatsara to compare it to the movement of the Saturn. Oh. Oh. Anuvatsara is, is for Dhruvaloka, is it? Or for. The... No, Anuvatsara is much below, Maharaj. As you see the sequence, if you can see there, Samvatsara, Parivatsara, Anuvatsara, then. In the previous verses, you can see that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Vatsara is at the top, right? Yes, correct. So, that what, is for the that's for, Dhruvaloka. For where? For th that is for Dhruvaloka. Dhruvaloka. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so... No, so then you go chapter chapter go chapter verse seventeen says situated above Saturn are twenty million eight hundred thousand miles above Earth are the seven saintly sages who are always thinking of the well being of the inhabitants of the un universe. They circumambulate the supreme abode of Lord Vishnu, known as Dhruvaloka, the pole star. So the Saptarishis are described that they're residing just below Dhruvaloka and they're very devoted. They're always circumambulating Dhruvaloka and they have great respect for Dhruva Maharaj and they're concerned for the well-being of the inhabitants of the universe. So this is very important. 
They're very great souls. And we can imagine how they must be thinking for the well-being of the universe just now. A nice verse is given in the purport. Lord Vishnu is the source of knowledge and transcendental bliss has assumed the form of Sisumara in the seventh heaven, which is situated in the topmost level of the universe. All the other planets beginning with the sun exist under the shelter of this Sisumara planetary system. So of course that leads us into the next chapter, chapter 23, the Sisumara planetary systems. And we're going to hear how the planets all uh, are arranged in a manner resembling the dolphin, Sisumara, right? The wonderful dolphin creature. And we'll see how the, the different planets resemble the different bodily parts of the dolphin. So Prabhupada added this nice verse from Madhvacharya, or Madhvacharya quotes the Brahmananda Purana. All right, are there any other questions or comments from the devotees? Anybody has any comments or questions to be discussed? Is it all clear to everyone? <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, please. Maharaj, sometimes we, we hear or we see the picture that the moon is on the head of Lord Shiva. Is placed. Yeah, what's on the head of Lord Shiva? A crescent moon, right? The crescent moon is on the head of Lord Shiva. And it is described in the Krishna book why that was placed on the head of Lord Shiva. Lord, because Lord Shiva, he drank the, the poison, the halahara. He drank that poison which was there. And so because he drank that, his throat became very hot, whole body became very hot with the poison, you know, the poison very heating. So he was given that crescent moon, the crescent moon was put on his head to cool him, to keep him cool. The moon is cooling, right? The rays of the moon are always cooling. We enjoy in the hot season when the moon comes up, then it's cooling after the hot sun. So the, head, the crescent moon on the head of Lord Shiva was placed there to keep Lord Shiva cool after he drank all the poison. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. We have to keep cool-headed also. That's why we shave our heads. There was an interesting pastime in London one time the woman came, the reporter came, and she had a mini skirt on. And it was a very cold, wintry day. And the woman came in her mini skirt to Prabhupada. And she was asking Prabhupada about why the devotees shave their heads. <laughs> and Prabhupada explained to her, he said, is, is it better to have warm legs and a cool head? He said, your legs must be very cold. He said, you're, walking, you're, you're coming here in your mini skirt. Your legs are not covered. He said, we have warm legs and cool head. We shave our heads to keep, our head, keep the head cool. <laughs> Better to have warm legs rather than cold legs and a hot head. <laughs> Hot-headed, right? Passionate, lusty people. So you have to keep the head cool. So Prabhupada always had the devotees shave their head. 
shave the head. People wanting to be initiated, you have to shave your head. You cannot take initiation without shaving the head. <laughs> Very important. So that's why Lord Shiva, he has long hair, of course. He has that long hair to catch the Ganga in his hair. But he has to, because he drank that poison that gave, the, that gave him the crescent moon to cool, cool him down. So you're wondering, must be a new moon, eh? Another moon. <laughs> well, how can they get moons? Every universe there's moon. There's a moon. Where did they get the, the moon to give to Lord Shiva? <laughs> well, but it came from Sagar Mantan, right? It came from where? Sagar Mantan. Which, the churning of the churning of the ocean, right? Sagar Mantan. Oh, it came from the churning of the milk ocean, right? Yeah, the moon came out from the churning of the milk ocean. So then they gave it to Lord Shiva at that time. <laughs> okay. Yes. Is that correct, Ramakrishna Prabhu? Is that right? They gave that the milk when the moon came out from the ocean of churning of the milk ocean. They gave it to the head, put it on the head of Lord Shiva. That's not specifically uh, mentioned here in the Bhagavatam, either in the eighth canto. Uh, what what we generally understand is, uh, I mean, the Shaivites they have a different story. I'm not very familiar with that. It doesn't. Yeah, I I I didn't read it in the Bhagavatam. It doesn't say in the Bhagavatam they gave the moon to Lord Shiva, did they? But in the Krishna book, it's mentioned. In the, yeah. in the Krishna book, it's mentioned how they 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 given the crescent to Lord crescent moon to Lord Shiva to cool him. Yeah. It didn't say where the moon came from. Yes, my <laughs> answer. I don't know. <laughs> so many things I don't know. I <laughs> just try to under understand. Any of the ladies know? Where did Lord Shiva get the moon from? To put on the head of Lord Shiva, where did it come from? We got a lot of very sh scholarly ladies here. Maybe some of them know. Marriages, do you know? Hare Krishna Maharaj, I've just heard of a story. Uh, I mean, I'm not very sure how, I mean, whether it's really, I mean, very authentic. Um, uh, you know, Daksha uh, Prajapati has given uh, 27 uh, daughters to the moon, but the moon gave preference to one of his wife, that is Rohini. So the, the Prajapati gets very angry and he curses the moon. So that time what uh, the moon does is he actually do, uh, he meditates on Shiva in a place called Somnath which also has one of the Jyotir Linga and uh, then the Shiva is pleased by moon and then he gives a protection to moon and he tells the curse is given to you to actually you know uh, to become he to get some diseases I am not very sure which disease and then he tells but I can only decrease that uh, you know the curse given by Prajapati because if the moon is not to be seen it's not very good for all the planetary systems so he tells that I give one I mean I decrease the curse and I and he takes the shelter of uh, Shiva moon so he puts the, the moon on his head and he gives a blessing that because of that the moon get a wax and vein that is what Shiva blesses him this is one of the stories I have not heard but I'm not very sure where the source is from 
Yes, Maharaja. Even I heard the same story, and the deceased person, Shaya, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, TB. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wonderful. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, that is that's true, Maharaj. Like twenty-seven stars, they are all the wives of uh, a moon god. But, but what did she say? Happened? What what happened? Where did the wife come? So he, he gives preference to one of his wives, Rohini. He favors uh, Rohini a lot. Oh, so yeah. the other daughters are uh, you know goes and complains like you know he's not giving much preference to her. So the Prajapati gets very angry with the moon. Well, the Prajapati got angry with the moon. Yes, because he favors one of his daughters and other daughters are neglected. Oh, Daksha got angry with the moon, is it? Yes, yes. And Daksha, he has a habit of cursing people, we know, yeah. Mm. So he cursed. Oh, I see now, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> So Daksha cursed. Okay, very interesting. Thank you, ladies. Very nice of you. <laughs> very interesting pastimes. The celestial politics are very interesting, Maharaj. Oh, oh, yeah. We find here, we find here that the moon took the shelter of uh, Shiva, and thereby he remained as a crescent. But later we see that the moon abducted the wife of uh, Brihaspati, Tara, and then impregnated her. At that time, the war broke, and the demons were on the side of the moon, and the, the, the devas, uh, they were sighted by Lord Shiva. So, on one side there was a shelter, on the other side there was a fighting. <laughs> it's very interesting. <laughs> Who can understand the minds of the demigods, huh? Yeah. I, I wonder huh, how long he has to remain a demigod if he goes, if he does like that, if he fights with the, with the followers. But Lord, Lord Shiva, Lord Shiva, of course, he's, well, of course, they have that problem, right? The Daksha Yagya. Lord Shiva and the demigods, the followers of Lord Shiva fought with the followers of Daksha. So Shivites, from that time they were cursed that the Shivites would be atheists. And the followers of Daksha, the Brahmanas, those Yagnik Brahmins, they would be practitioners of dull rituals with no meaning. So Prabhupada said, both curses are in effect today. Generally, the followers of Shiva are atheists, and the Brahmins do dull rituals. All right, so we'll stop here tonight, and tomorrow we'll go on to chapter 23, the Sishumara uh, stars. Thank you very much for your association. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Go back to Vrinda Ki Jai. Jai.